Lately, my life has become a tapestry woven with strange and unsettling events. To set the stage, my husband, a truck driver, traverses the roads for three weeks at a stretch, leaving me in solitude. Our abode is nestled deep within the woods, with the nearest neighbors a daunting two miles away. It is an inconspicuous haven, hidden unless one possesses an intimate knowledge of its whereabouts. I, a recluse by nature, toil away from the comfort of my home, sharing scant details about my existence on social media. My online presence, particularly on Facebook, is minimal, reserved for maintaining ties with a select few family members. Thus, it struck me as disconcerting when, a week ago, a Facebook user with an obviously fabricated identity reached out. This interloper not only discerned my true name, concealed behind a pen name on Facebook where I share memes and artwork, but also wielded knowledge about my residence, town, and workplace. A disquieting episode, yet I opted to dismiss it. The following day brought another message from the same enigmatic user, delving into invasive queries and uttering unsettling proclamations about their dark desires, even insinuating the ease of breaching the sanctity of my home. Alarmed, I shared this with my husband, who, to his dismay, found himself besieged by similarly distressing messages from the same source, probing into the recesses of my private life. In response, we deemed it prudent to sever ties with this unsettling account. Despite our efforts, the haunting messages persisted, manifesting as calls and texts, each time met with nothing but ominous. Labored breathing before the line fell silent, fearing for my safety, I took matters into my own hands, installing trail cams and security cameras to surveil my abode and its periphery. Today, while I ventured into town for errands, my ring doorbell sounded an ominous alert. On screen, a man cloaked in a black hoodie, visage shrouded in darkness, stood menacingly on my back porch, pounding on the door with increasing intensity, his voice piercing the solitude, calling out my name. This eerie spectacle endured for an agonizing fifteen minutes until, abruptly, he ceased, vanishing into the depths of the woods. Hastening to action, I summoned the authorities, who, upon inspection, found no trace of the intruder. Armed with images from my surveillance devices, they regretfully informed me that, without immediate peril or a breach, their hands were tied, suggesting the acquisition of a guard dog as a feeble defense. Despite my husband's conjecture that it might be a neighbor or friend indulging in a tasteless prank, the bizarre conduct does not align with the known behavior of anyone in my circle. The unsettling queries and malevolent intentions articulated by this shadowy figure transcend the realm of mere jest. Despite the skepticism from my family, the sight of an intruder in my secluded backyard at an unearthly hour is far from ordinary. Genuine fear courses through me, and I find myself paralyzed by uncertainty grappling with the ominous unknown. Story 2 I cannot recall the app I was on, but my quest for love led me astray, stumbling upon a facade in the form of a TSA agent. Initially, our conversations revolved around matters of the heart, but soon she delved into territories of banking, loyalty, and the order of things. Her demeanor shifted, becoming a vexing presence. Frustrated, I attempted to sever ties on Google Chat, a realm best avoided unless plunging unwittingly into the dark web. Yet, it was on this very app that my encounter with her unfolded. I cannot recollect her name Sierra, perhaps. Regardless, our exchanges deepened, weaving a deceptive tapestry of affection. Alas, her discussions veered towards the ominous notion of a shared bank account, an unsettling proposition, and an undeniable crimson flag. As her petulance escalated, I deemed it necessary to expunge her from my social realms. In a twisted turn of events, she unearthed my phone number, bombarding me with a barrage of harassing messages. Her threats of tormenting both me and other women for not reciprocating her affections plunged me into disarray. Swiftly, I sought refuge in the solace of my mother, frantically sharing the incessant stream of texts. The ordeal prompted me to discard my phone, ushering in a new one just in time for Christmas. A fortuitous escape, as my old device reached its expiration date. This unsettling episode serves as a stark cautionary tale, exposing the deceptive facade that individuals on dating platforms may adopt. 
Google Chat, an innocent communication tool, unraveled as a gateway to the murky depths of the dark web. Even though I had not willingly shared my phone number, the leak occurred, reinforcing the need for vigilance. May this account serve as a somber reminder that the allure of dating apps conceals potential peril, urging all to tread cautiously and avoid the siren's call of the digital... Story 3 Years have passed since this chilling incident, a narrative I have kept locked away, shrouded in the shadows of my own silence. The specter of fear lingered long, delaying the sharing of this unsettling tale. Forgive me if my recollection seems fragmented. I will delve into it directly. In those days, I toiled in a multifaceted establishment comprising a hotel, banquet halls, and a restaurant. My youthfulness and amiable disposition fostered acquaintanceships with some co-workers, while others remained fleeting hellos in the backdrop of my nights after school and weekends, frequently enmeshed in special events. One fateful Saturday morning, the front office manager approached me with an air of concern, even panic, etched on his face. He probed into my interactions with his son, someone I regarded as more of an acquaintance than a friend. S.S., laboring in a different department within the hotel, was linked to me through another co-worker. T. My exchanges with S. were limited to polite greetings. He, admittedly, exuded a certain awkward. The front office manager's inquiries took an unnerving turn as he asked about plans to meet S. the previous night and whether I had ever mentioned marriage to him. Perplexed, I responded in the negative. Unraveling the bizarre tapestry, it transpired that S., plagued by mental issues exacerbated by drug use, harbored delusions. The night prior, his parents discovered him in his room, cocooned under a blanket, rocking back and forth to loud music. Beneath that blanket lurked a chilling ensemble, the backpack housing rope, a knife, and drugs. In a twisted declaration, S. claimed we were to meet that night and embark on matrimony. When reason failed, his parents had no recourse but to involve the authorities, resulting in S's confinement to a mental institution for months. The front office manager, visibly drained, revealed the extent of this nightmarish ordeal. Subsequently, S faced a ban from the premises, and henceforth, I was accompanied in my car each night, the shadows whispering unsettling in a conversation with T. I learned that the same night, S had attempted to coax him out of his house under the guise of wanting to talk. When T resisted, S resorted to shouting warnings to stay away from me. Odd, but not alarming to T, given S's peculiar nature that never hinted at violence. The backpack, a haunting constant. Upon his release from the mental institution, I remained oblivious. Unfortunately, my guard waned, and I failed to detect him trailing me home one day. The moment arrived when he knocked on my door, catching me unguarded. An uneasy encounter unfolded as he sought conversation, and I found myself outside, hoping to outmaneuver or appease him. S painted a facade of improvement, claiming enrollment in school during the summer, a claim easily debunked. The conversation delved into the unsettling terrain of my attire at Mother's Day brunch, two years past, and the unnerving inquiry if I still possessed the dress, fabricating excuses about work and diverting to discussions about his father, who remained employed at the hotel. I managed to coerce him to depart. Subsequent encounters revealed a menacing persistence. My brother, summoned to intervene, issued a stern warning, but the shadows continued to harbor his presence, a stalking specter undeterred. The echoes of his appearance persisted, a phantom menace that haunted my surroundings, driving me into seclusion. What became of him remains unknown. My terror endured. This harrowing episode coupled with two other stalkers in my early twenties, cast a pall over my existence. It is crucial to emphasize that one's appearance or actions bear no responsibility when someone fixates upon you. Despite societal standards deeming me attractive, I shrouded myself in self-imposed exile, altering my appearance and averting gazes, a somber testament to the enduring impact of those who seize upon obsession. Story 4 Allow me to preface this by acknowledging the numerous comments and messages I have received. While I appreciate the concern and advice, let me clarify that I am not a young person seeking attention. I assure everyone that I am of sound body and mind, and I am not fabricating these events. I do not grapple with a mental illness, though I empathize with those who do. 
I admit my lack of familiarity with the internet and this app, so my apologies for still grappling with how to post pictures and such. I will figure it out eventually. Now, for an update. The police have confiscated my cameras, holding them as evidence, or so they claim. Yes, more pictures were captured. During my younger brother's visit, a college student, we hoped the presence of a larger male would deter the mysterious intruder. However, a few nights into his stay, both of us were jolted awake by banging on the front door. A review of the security cameras revealed the same eerie figure, hood obscuring his face, standing there. My brother threatened to call the police, to which the man nonchalantly responded with an okay, laughed, and strolled off into the woods. We reported the incident to the police once again, but their response lacked the seriousness we expected. Sleep became a luxury neither of us could afford. The subsequent week, with my husband's return, seemed quieter, and I dared to believe the Tormentor had abandoned their twisted game. Yet, this past weekend, after a celebration with friends, we discovered a roll of duct tape and a screwdriver on the front porch, items not belonging to us. Reviewing the cameras exposed glimpses of the culprit pacing the porch and peeking through the front window. Hastening into town, we reported the unsettling findings to the police once more. This time, they combed the property and ventured into the woods, yet no trace was found. Hopes now to hinge on identifying the individual through the camera footage. Despite my husband's attempt to rationalize that the intruder may be mentally ill without malicious intent, the fear persists. Adding to the nightmare, my friend and neighbor have reported sightings matching the troublemaker's description outside a large, white, windowless van at my friend's workplace, tailing her home on multiple occasions. My neighbor shared similar encounters, mentioning the man stopping at her house, inquiring about the neighbor up there, with my house being the sole target. Disturbingly, reports circulate about a van resembling the one in question linked to trafficking schemes in the vicinity, heightening my unease. Whether the intruder is mentally ill, involved in human trafficking, or just orchestrating a sick joke remains unclear. Terrified and sickened by the thought of remaining home, my husband's absence compels me to seek refuge away from town. This decision, undisclosed to anyone, stems from a lack of trust in family and friends. With my whereabouts undisclosed, I am left to witness the unfolding events. I am aware that to some, I may sound irrational, with accusations of fabrication lingering. But at what cost? I had a private, contented life, gaining nothing from these circumstances. Living in fear, I yearn for a return to normalcy and find myself regretting the move to this small town. Story 5 I am a college student, dedicating most of my time to studying inside the school premises. Yesterday, after class and a library study session, I decided to grab some chips from a campus store around 5.00 p.m. Taking a moment to eat, I eventually headed to my car. However, before reaching the parking lot, I noticed a guy leisurely wandering around. Sensing something amiss, I quickened my pace, but he turned towards me. Matching my speed, his intense gaze locked onto mine, unsettling me. Something about it fell off, different from a normal. As he closed the distance, he abruptly stopped and exclaimed, Whoa, I'm so sorry, I just had to stop for a second. You are just really pretty. Caught off guard, I stood there speechless and uncomfortable. A feeble mention of having a boyfriend prompted an apology from him, and the conversation ended as he walked toward the library, leaving me to head to my car, hoping he had not witnessed my departure through the library's glass walls. The incident did not bother me much until today. Arriving at school late, I skipped my first class and spent two hours in the library before heading to my last class. Upon exiting the library, the same guy reappeared, engaging in that familiar deep eye contact. It felt awkward, but I dismissed it, continuing towards my class. Oddly, he followed suit. Doubts arose about his affiliation with the school. His small, non-academic backpack and solitary wandering raised suspicions. He walked so slowly that my normal pace overtook his sluggish progress, and his gaze intensified as he trailed behind. Concerned, I hastened my steps, seeking the company of someone familiar. Luckily, I found a classmate and walked with her to class. Glancing back, he was still there, fixated on me. Panicked, I sped up, regretting leaving him behind. His persistent presence behind me intensified my anxiety. Desperate to find someone I knew, I reached my class and 
upon entering, no longer spotted him. After class, my boyfriend joined me, and I recounted the unsettling events. As we exited the building, there he was again, walking in circle. I pointed him out to my boyfriend, who observed his suspicious behavior. The man then diverted toward the library, a route he knew I frequented. Disturbed, I altered my path, hoping to evade him. Upon turning, I noticed he did not continue walking but retraced his steps in my direction. Distressed, I entered the library for tutoring while my boyfriend investigated. The man's actions raised further concern, prompting my boyfriend to inform a school officer. I earnestly hope my instincts are wrong, but my growing unease for my safety persists. Story 6 in the dying days of summer 2019, I, thus sought solace from the mundane shackles of university revisions, drowning my ennui in the digital realm of Tinder, a haven for the bored and the solitary. Amidst the myriad of faces, one stood out, a man I will refer to as Ted. He claimed to share the same academic corridors as I, his profile portraying a visage of allure. Little did I know, the lens of attraction can be a deceptive illusion. Our initial exchanges were innocuous, mere echoes in the vast cavern of digital dialogue. Ted, harmless, persuaded me to relinquish my number. The ensuing weeks unfolded in nocturnal conversations, his voice an unwelcome companion in the solitude of my night. An insatiable self-indulgence manifested in his monologues, leaving my solitude untouched. Then came the fateful proposal to meet. The city center served as our backdrop, and upon laying eyes on Ted, the chasm between expectation and reality yawned wide. Deceptive angles and digital sorcery had crafted an illusion, and I, a reluctant participant in this facade, pressed on. Red flags fluttered like warning signs in the night. Odd questions and discomfort danced beneath the surface. Despite misgivings, the night continued, lubricated by the intoxicating elixir of alcohol, a decision driven not by desire but by the distortion of beer mochito vodka goggles. Morning brought regret, and as I drove Ted to the train station, an unspoken agreement lingered. This was a fleeting encounter, a mistake made in the haze of inebriation. Yet, the tendrils of this mistake tightened their grip Ted, persistent and oblivious to my unspoken reservations, demanded a repeat performance. Obligation and guilt conspired, leading me to acquiesce. The ensuing encounters unfurled like a macabre bands Ted's presence a haunting specter, a relentless shadow cast upon my every step. Attempts to sever ties met with futility Ted's infatuation, transformed into obsession, a ceaseless pursuit that infiltrated the sanctuary of my campus life. A menacing silhouette trailing my every move. His eyes fixated upon me. Friends became unwitting messengers, cautioning of his proximity. I was a puppet, and he, the puppeteer orchestrating a sinister symphony. In the depths of this disconcerting torment, salvation arrived in an unexpected guise, Elliot. Once Ted's companion, now estranged Elliot bore witness to a darker truth Ted's veneer of normalcy shattered, revealing a sinister underbelly. Elliot unraveled a narrative of disturbing proclamations, violent fantasies, and a chilling revelation. Ted was an imposter, a phantom infiltrating the sanctuary of academia. Terrified and compelled by a duty to protect Elliot and I embarked on a journey to expose this malevolent intruder. University security mobilized, posters adorned the walls and a shroud of vigilance enveloped the campus. The police, though restricted by the nuances of legality, etched a cautionary note on Ted's record. Elliot's revelation unmasked Ted's identity, a mentally unhinged, drug-addled menace, imprisoned in the confines of mental institutions. The specter of attempted rape cast a sinister shadow over his existence, revealing a volatile concoction of addiction and violent tendency. As the echoes of this harrowing chapter faded, the specter of Ted lingered. The pandemic-induced exile to online realms shielded me from his physical presence, yet the fear remained, an indelible mark etched into the recesses of my consciousness. The hope, a fervent prayer, to never cross paths with the malevolent phantom that once haunted my every step. Story 7 Post-college life beckoned, and with a diploma in hand, I yearned to escape the clutches of Florida. As a 23-year-old, brimming with possibilities, I charted a course to a new existence on the opposite side of the country. 
The plan was meticulously laid out. I bid farewell to my job, entrusting a friend to take the reins of my lease. Alone in my townhouse since my previous roommate's graduation, my friend settled into the vacant room as I prepared to embark on my journey. One fateful night, the veneer of normalcy shattered. At the witching hour of 10 p.m., the tranquility of a shared TV session was disrupted by an insistent knock at the door. My friend, the unwitting harbinger of an unsettling saga, rose to answer the call. Returning with a bag of food from an unknown sandwich delivery, confusion gripped us. My name and address adorned the receipt, but the phone number, a clandestine, dialing the mysterious digits, a chilling void greeted my ears. Ambient sounds and labored breathing spoke louder than words. The number, traced to an elusive app, hinted at a prank or misunderstanding. A week's interlude birthed another knock, a delivery manifesting an unwarranted intrusion. My friend, the reluctant gatekeeper, faced a persistent driver, recounting a tale of a man who ordered with an eerie familiarity with my preferences. Calls to the enigmatic number echoed into the abyss, unanswered, except for one occasion. A ghostly whisper confirmed my continued residence. Fear coiled around my existence, each unanswered call amplifying the ominous uncertainty. The delayed move prolonged the ordeal, transforming my sanctuary into a chamber of dread. The stalker's persistence transcended the realm of food deliveries, manifesting in a symphony of harassment. Calls, relentless in frequency, pierced the veil of night, the stranger's silent vigil a menacing specter. Social media became a battleground, besieged by unfamiliar friend requests, peddling fabricated encounter. An unsettling crescendo ensued as eggs. Projectiles of malevolence assaulted the townhouse, laying bare the stalker's intimate knowledge of my whereabout. Paralyzed by terror, my refuge became a gilded cage. The stalker, an unseen puppeteer, choreographed my every move. The invisible menace wielded a sinister omnipotence, orchestrating a reign of torment. The torment subsided with my eventual escape. The stalker's number blocked, but the scars lingered. Even in the sanctuary of distance, the trauma lingered, echoing in the refusal to answer unknown numbers or the dread that accompanies contactless deliveries. The specter may have receded, but the ghostly touch of anxiety lingers, a perennial reminder of a malevolent presence that refuses to fade away. Story 8 In the tapestry of my childhood, a chapter etched in the early 90s unfolds, a time when my family dwelled in a house bordered by a sizable, wooded expanse. The allure of this hinterland, while not vast enough to consume one in its depths, beckoned exploration. A magical world to my nine-year-old self and friends, a sanctuary for summer escapades. The 90s, an era of different norms, granted us the freedom to venture into those woods until the curtain of dusk descended. My best friend and I reveled in the enchantment, weaving tales of hide-and-seek, mimicking army exploits, and engaging in epic Star Wars battle. Yet, our paramount delight was found in the ascent of trees. A colossal pine, nestled in the heart of the woods, became our arboreal haven. Its branches, a ladder to a vantage point above the forest canopy, offered respite and solitude. On solo sojourns, I would ascend its boughs, basking in the peaceful embrace of solitude gazing upon the world below. A pivotal Sunday evening marked a shift in the narrative. The late summer sun lingered, casting a warm glow on my clandestine retreat. As I waited for the sunset, an inconspicuous snap echoed, a twig yielding beneath an unwelcome intruder. Looking down, my gaze met a man in a filthy brown jacket, his beard patchy, hair disheveled from relentless fingers running through his eyes, filled with an unsettling amalgamation of wonder and delight pierced through me. A silent exchange ensued, a tableau of discomfort. I dared not provoke this peculiar spectator, frozen in a tableau of dread. Breaking the silence, he queried, are you coming down anytime soon? My head shook in vehement refusal, an unspoken plea for him to retreat. A moment's discomfort should have sufficed for any decent soul, but his grin persisted, revealing the sinister agenda veiled behind his gaze. An attempt to ascend the tree met the frailty of its branches, a divine intervention sparing me from an unwelcome visitor. Panic gripped me, and my cries for help pierced the air. The man, undeterred, mumbled curses, his limbs flailing in an unsettling rage. 
A phantom battle unfolded as he gestured to an unseen adversary, his retreat marked by stumbling steps into the shadows. The echoes of my pleas went unanswered, and I clung to the sanctuary above, uncertain if the malevolent presence had truly dissipated. The descent, a fearful plunge as the sun dipped below the horizon, culminated in a sprint home, terror gnawing at my heels. My revelation to my parents yielded no trace of the intruder. The house harbored us for another two years before we relocated across town. The woods, once a realm of childhood fantasies, transformed into a haunting memory. The man in the filthy jacket, an enigma lingering in the shadows of my thoughts, whispering unanswered questions into the silence of the night. Story 9 In the shadowed recesses of my basement suite, a peculiar and unsettling tale unfolds, a narrative interwoven with the mysteries lurking beyond our window. Our abode, nestled beneath an ordinary dwelling, shelters us from the world outside, or so we thought. Our neighbor, a man, and his young daughter share the same abode but remain distant acquaintances. The backdrop, a detached home with windows flanking only its sides, offered no view into the backyard. A fade of normalcy veiled the unsettling events that would soon unfold. Beyond our backyard, a ravine cradled a tiny creek, its steep banks shrouded in bushes and trees. The backdrop of our lives took an ominous turn three months ago when the tranquility of our nocturnal abode was shattered. A cacophony of banging, flashlights piercing the darkness, and the disquieting presence of strangers encroaching upon our space ushered in an unsettling reality. The police, summoned by our neighbor above, were swift to respond. They bore witness to his distress, a man haunted by the specter of harassment on his property. A dance with the unknown ensued, leaving us grasping for answers amid the uncertainty. The neighbor's plea to investigate the creek as the point of ingress remained unanswered, dismissed by the fleeting glares of a week-long reprieve offered a semblance of normalcy. But the malevolent forces returned, a recurring nightmare that gripped our neighbor's sanity. A despondent vigil unfolded, with a baseball bat as his companion, as the man feared for his daughter's safety. The installation of cameras, vigilant sentinels against the unseen tormentors, cast a fleeting shadow over the unease. Yet, the lights persisted, laser pointers, flashlights, piercing the veil of night, emanating from the murky depths of the creek. Skepticism waned as our neighbor's nightly ordeal unfolded, a relentless torment that defied reason. The disquieting revelation of someone lurking in the creek, tormented from the shadows, eclipsed our initial doubts. Driven by concern and a sense of shared vulnerability, I ventured forth to uncover the enigma. An outdoor camera, equipped with the prowess of night vision, stood as a testament to our newfound vigilance. As it made its journey to our abode, I embarked on a journey of my own, tracing the path along the ravine, a route accessible to the public. The journey unraveled a disconcerting truth. An established path, well-trodden and marked by footprints, led to our property. A clandestine thoroughfare emerged, veiled by bushes and thick brush, a nefarious route ending precisely where our neighbor had pointed. The creek harbored a malevolent presence, someone who had infiltrated our lives, tormenting us without rhyme or reason. As the arrival of the security camera looms, questions linger. How did the intruder know when the cameras went up? Why the persistent focus on our neighbor's bedroom? The enigma remains unsolved, an unsettling reality that refuses to recede into the shadows. I am left with an unsettling mix of disbelief and horror, grappling with a malevolence that seems to thrive just beyond our awareness. Story 10 As the shadows of the Los Padres National Park embraced our camping escapade, a tale unfolded blending camaraderie with an unexpected and unsettling nocturnal encounter. The year was 2016, and a group of friends, fueled by an adventurous spirit, embarked on a camping venture in Southern California, blissfully indifferent to the impending El Nio rainstorm. Undeterred by the storm's imminent arrival, we traversed the 45-minute journey to our chosen campsite, nestled within the forested expanse of Los Padres. The campsite, boasting family-friendly appeal, featured a clearing embraced by a hundred campsites encircling the forest. Our chosen spot, beneath the sheltering canopy of towering trees, promised respite from the rain, with the added convenience of restrooms a mere thirty yards away. 
The camaraderie of the group infused the campsite with energy as we swiftly erected our tents, forming a protective enclave against the impending rain. A 30 foot by 30 foot thick blue canopy tarp, a stroke of genius on my part, draped over our tents, a pragmatic shield against the elements. The plastic tarp, however, betrayed our movements, echoing our footsteps with a symphony of crunches. As nightfall descended, the campfire became our communal hearth, casting a warm glow that belied the unease stirring within the forest. The revelation of sparsely occupied RVs in the vicinity marked a contrast to our humble encampment. Unfazed, fatigue from a day's work crept over me, and I succumbed to its embrace, beckoning my friends to follow suit. Before surrendering to the embrace of slumber, a mischievous impulse took hold. A prank call, veiled in darkness and mystery, unfolded. Whispered conspiracies and stifled laughter accompanied the anonymous calls to friends and neighboring tents. The night air resonated with tension and amusement as the unsuspecting victims grappled with the enigma of the late night call. Morning broke, and as promised, I initiated a culinary awakening with pancakes sizzling on the campfire. The savory aroma roused my friends from their tents, creating a jovial ambiance. However, the lightheartedness gave way to a revelation that transcended the realm of harmless pranks. AJ, with a solemn tone, addressed the elephant in the room. The prank had taken an unexpected turn. Our laughter yielded to a remorseful acknowledgement, as AJ recounted a nightmarish episode that unfolded after my descent into slumber. Unknown to me, as the nocturnal hours unfolded, a disconcerting presence disturbed the tranquility of our camp. Footsteps echoed on the blue tarp surrounding our tents, initially dismissed as harmless until their rhythmic cadence exposed a human origin. A mysterious figure wove intricate patterns around our tents, fingers tracing the fabric walls in eerie contemplation. The climax of the nocturnal intrusion unfolded when the silhouette of a man's face breached the confines of the tent, casting an unsettling gaze upon a J and S, feigning sleep in the darkness. The intruder, silent and stoic, ventured no words, leaving an indelible mark of discomfort. A retreat into the night followed, but not before the unmistakable sound of footsteps faded into the obscurity of the forest. The breakfast table became a forum for heated exchanges and bewildered revelations. Accusations of nocturnal trespassing echoed. Each friend convinced the other was the orchestrator of the unsettling events. Amidst the bickering, an unexpected visitor materialized, a man of disheveled appearance, marked by the scent of liquor and the weariness etched into the man, uninvited and oblivious to social norms, extended a dubious invitation to visit his RV. The atmosphere thickened with unease as we rejected his offer, only to witness his departure with a toothless smile and an implicit threat lingering in the air. The disconcerting encounters persisted, culminating in a proposition to sell an RV, shadowed by the man's tale of marital woes. As the day unfolded, the man's erratic presence persisted, and the group resolved to remain vigilant. The inexplicable choice to use our campsite's restroom, despite an RV equipped with facilities, fueled suspicions. The man's departure before sunset brought relief, but the lingering disquiet left a lasting impression on our weekend escapade. Story 11 In the nostalgic echoes of Ohio's 70s, where childhood reveries found expression in the vast expanse of Joe's farm and the adjoining forest, a tale unraveled, blurring the boundaries between innocence and disquiet. The tapestry of adventure woven in those early years took a turn as the duo, now in high school, sought to recreate the essence of Stand By Me, wandering the railroad tracks in pursuit of bridges, rivers, and clandestine campsites. Fast forward to a summer in the mid to 90s, and Joe and the narrator found themselves reunited fueled by nostalgia and the alchemy of beer. An impromptu decision birthed a plan to retrace the tracks of their youth under the looming shadows of a bygone era. Armed with memories and a map, they set forth from their hometown, not along the familiar route but veering into the unknown for a touch of adventure. The day unfolded with the sun's warmth, interspersed with moments of melancholic reflection. A bridge became a haven for shared moments, infused with a joint's haze. But as dusk approached, they ventured into the woods, thick with trees like a tunnel alongside the tracks. It was here, in this sylvan retreat, that the veil between past and present would be lifted amidst the tranquil setting chosen for their night's camp. The duo's instinctive caution led them to scout the surroundings. 
A short hill beckoned, and as they ascended, an old building emerged in the distance, weathered, abandoned, and hauntingly resembling a church. A cross stood sentinel, and the absence of doors or windows rendered it a skeletal structure, a relic in the wilderness. Unease gripped them, but curiosity compelled a closer look. The journey downhill unraveled the church's abandonment, peering inside revealing pews and a forgotten pulpit. Yet, as they retreated to their chosen campsite, a subtle disquiet lingered, an unspoken agreement that the abandoned church, though eerie, was just another facet of the wood's natural mystique. As night draped its shroud, the tranquility was pierced by an unexpected symphony, singing emanating from the direction of the church. Suspicion gave way to bewilderment as the duo strained to discern the otherworldly hymns, their nocturnal vigil bathed in moonlight. What began as distant singing evolved into a spectral chant, echoing through the forest. A decision to ascend the hill once more revealed the source, flickering candlelight within the church. Figures, shadows cast by the dim illumination, engaged in an enigmatic ceremony. The duo, frozen with disbelief, witnessed the congregation within, voices rising and falling in a cadence that defied understanding. The eeriness intensified as the lone male voice, resonating like an Old Testament preacher in an unfamiliar tongue, reverberated through the, the intensity reached a crescendo, culminating in a sustained wail that penetrated the very essence of the forest. The auditory assault forced the duo to cover their ears, a futile attempt to escape the unsettling chorus. As silence claimed the night once more, Joe's hand on the narrator's shoulder signaled an ominous revelation. The congregation was emerging from the church, holding hands and terrified. The duo abandoned their campsite, fleeing towards the railroad tracks, the haunting echoes of the ethereal procession haunting their retreat. Lights, erratic and shaking, followed them down the hill. Running in a frenzied escape, they eventually reached a road in a small town, seeking refuge in a 24-hour gas station as they pondered the surreal encounter. To those who dismissed the tale as mere mischief, the voices lingering in the woods told a different story. The haunting melodies and the enigmatic congregation etched an indelible mark on the narrator's memory, forever casting a shadow over the idyllic adventures of their youth. The woods, once a realm of innocent play, now held secrets that defied explanation, a testament to the eerie unknown that lurks within the heart of nature. Story 12 Amidst the quiet expanse of the southern countryside, where nature's beauty intertwined with solitude, a tale unfolded, resonating with the eerie undertones of a night that transcended the realm of the ordinary, shared on Reddit as a culmination of unspoken experiences. This narrative emerged as a farewell post, a testament to an encounter etched in the storyteller's memory. The backdrop was a rural setting, where the absence of traditional hangout spots compelled the narrator, during teenage years, to seek solace in late-night drive. A ritual of cruising through desolate country roads, accompanied by music and the solitude of the night, became a way to escape monotony. Yet, one fateful night, the routine morphed into an unexpected journey. The chronicle unfurled in summertime, July or August, as the narrator ventured towards a park at the end of a desolate country road. The road, flanked by gradually vanishing houses, meandered into the heart of the park. A storm-laden night, post a severe tempest, set the stage for an unusual encounter. Upon reaching the park, a fallen tree obstructed the exit, casting a shadow over the otherwise scenic route. Attempting to navigate around it, the narrator found their car ensnared in wet muddy grass. Panic set in, but with cell service as an ally, a tow truck was summoned. The solitude of the park at 3 a.m., devoid of campers, introduced an element of vulnerability. As the wait unfolded, the narrator observed a field populated by deer, offering an ephemeral sense of calm. However, a nap interrupted by an inexplicable sense of being watched unleashed an unsettling reality. The deer, once serene, became harbingers of an unseen menace staring fixedly into the unknown. The anticipation intensified when the deer, prompted by an imperceptible force, fled the field. In the silence that ensued, an unsettling feeling persisted. Relief arrived in the form of tow truck lights, dissipating the eerie ambience. The driver attributed the unease to a bear or bobcat, reassuring the narrator. Yet, as the tow truck operator cleared the fallen tree, a man emerged from the tree line an unexpected spectator to the nocturnal ordeal. 
The unsettling image of the man, standing in the middle of the road, watched as the narrator drove away, imprinting a haunting memory. The tow truck driver, nonchalant, offered a mundane explanation, but the lingering unease endured. The tale, hidden from the narrator's parents for years, carried an unsettling weight when finally shared. The avoidance of the park, even in daylight, and the abandonment of late-night drives epitomized the lasting impact of that night. The narrative concluded with an emphatic plea to the mysterious man in the woods, an invocation to a destiny where their paths would never intertwine again. Story 13 I have never shared this story with anyone, not even my parents or those around me. This incident occurred when I was between the ages of 14 and 15. My friends and I used to spend our free time at the local mall. One day, I arrived earlier than my friends and waited at a seating area in the food court. There were several couches arranged nearby, and it was a common area for anyone to sit. I did not pay much attention when a man sat on a couch across from me. I was engrossed in my phone not paying attention until he initiated a conversation by asking if I frequented this place. I looked up to see a man in his late 50s or early 60s. I told him that I often spent time here with my friends, and he introduced himself. I still remember his first name because it was the same as my dad's. At first, I did not feel uneasy. He was a normal person, and there was no initial reason to be suspicious. So, I shared my name, and we engaged in small talk. I am a sociable person and I have been that way since an early age. So I did not mind chatting with what I assumed was just an older man wanting to have a conversation. He started asking about my interests, and I mentioned that I enjoyed going to the local lake to fish and swim. To my surprise, he said he frequented the same lake every weekend for the same activities. I also mentioned my love for making music, particularly playing the piano, and he enthusiastically shared his own passion for music. As the conversation continued, I began to feel increasingly uncomfortable. It was as if he was trying too hard to impress me and win me over. He claimed to have a boat at the lake and suggested we should go there sometime. He even mentioned that he lived right across the street from the mall and invited me to visit his place to play the piano. He went as far as describing the housing complex and providing directions. He even offered to have me come over and play his piano on the same day. With each passing minute, it felt like he was making more effort to get me to hang out with him. Speaking with him gave me an unsettling, primal instinct that something was wrong, like I was in the presence of a person with malicious intent. After about five to ten minutes of conversation, I fabricated an excuse, claiming that my friends had arrived and I needed to find them. He reluctantly accepted and wished me well. A couple of weeks passed, and my friends and I returned to the mall. As we walked through the mall, I spotted the same man, wearing a hoodie, passing us in the opposite direction. Our eyes briefly locked, and my heart sank. I did not look back and soon forgot about it. Over the next two months, I continued to see him randomly at the mall. I brushed it off as a coincidence, assuming that there were regular visitors at the mall. Although I felt a bit uneasy each time, I dismissed it. Then, one day, I went to the mall with my friends. We spent a few hours there before parting ways to go home. When I got home, no one else was there, and I was alone for a couple of hours. Around 8 p.m., my mom came home and appeared worried. She asked if I had noticed a man outside. I said no, and she showed me her phone. We had two cameras, one in the front of the house and one in the back. About 20 minutes after I had arrived home, someone approached our house. Our front wall blocked much of the view to the street, so we could not see a car or anything, just a man walking up to our house from the street. The camera near our front door showed him approaching the driveway. I realized it was the same man I had seen at the mall. I felt a wave of sickness as he peered through the front door glass. He then moved to the side of our house near the driveway, out of the camera's view. My room was not located in that area, so I had no idea what he was doing there. After a while, he returned to look through the front door again before walking away. I did not know if I was too embarrassed or scared to say anything, so I told my mom that I had not noticed and did not know who he was. She found it strange that he was looking into our house but suggested he might have been a homeless person or someone with substance abuse issues due to our house's proximity to a busy street with a bus stop. My dad added more security cameras after this incident to deter such incidents, but I never admitted to having seen the man before. After he showed up at our house, it was confirmed to me that he had been following me and I could not discern his intentions. He never returned to our house. 
We moved to a different part of the city not long after, and I was too far from that mall to encounter him again. I have not seen him since, and hope I never will. Story 14 For context, I moved into my new house about a year or two ago. I had been living in the area for a year before, but we were evicted due to the owners of our old house wanting to move in. I am a young female, still living with my family, which makes this story even more unsettling. From my window, you can see our fence and the neighboring house. They are situated on a small hill, so the fence does not obstruct the view. My first encounter with this man happened late at night. I was with some friends while all our parents were out at a party. I must emphasize that my friends and I are old enough to stay home alone, and we were responsible. We were just relaxing in my room with no lights or music on. We had turned the TV off when we were alone. We initially heard my dog barking for a good ten minutes, which we attributed to her tendency to bark at anything, including birds on the power line or a bug on the front porch. However, we started hearing stranger noises, like rustling sounds circling the perimeter of my room and scratching on the walls. Just when we were starting to feel scared, the loudest bangs I have ever heard started pounding on my glass sliding door. All four of us rushed out of my room to investigate what could be making so much noise. We were met with an aggressive dog relentlessly pounding on the glass door. My dog was frightened, which was unusual for her, and she backed away behind me with all her fur standing on end. Then we saw him, a man dressed entirely in black, standing at the door. We all stood there motionless, but my friend's fight-or-flight response kicked in, and he lunged to lock the door. Simultaneously, the man reached for a two. My friend shouted, What are you doing here? Who are you? The man responded simply with, I don't know, and then walked away with his dog, which was on a leash. When our parents returned, we recounted the incident to them. They asked us why we did not call them, and in truth, we should have, but I did not want to spoil my mom's birthday party. I have since learned from that mistake. Two days later, my mom confronted our neighbor while he was mowing the lawn. He admitted that it was indeed him and claimed that his dog had run into our gate and he was retrieving it. He said he had meant to come and talk to her earlier about it but did not. I initially thought it was a straightforward story until I reflected on that night. The gate that his dog ran through had a secure clasp that was closed that evening. We had it there to keep our dog inside and to prevent anything from coming in, but it could be opened manually. This indicated that the man had opened the gate and let himself and his dog in. My theory is that he heard the music stop and did not see any lights from his house, prompting him to decide to come over and, well, I do not know, potentially rob us. Strange noises we heard must have been him skulking around the perimeter of my room for ten minutes before attempting to enter. We filed a police report, but nothing happened for a few months until one night. I was in bed, nearly falling asleep but still adjusting my pillows. As I turned around to make myself more comfortable, I saw a face outside my window, staring back at me. The person wore a black face covering, and I immediately texted my mom before freezing. I heard a movement, and my mom came to check, but there was nothing there. This was not a product of my imagination, as my neighbor's lights were visible through the crack in my curtain, but the face obscured most of the light. Since then, I have noticed this person watching me, and whenever I catch them, they quickly get up from their balcony and leave. To my neighbor who relentlessly watches me, let us never meet again. Story 15 This incident occurred years ago when I was a naive teenager, a girl who loved walking alone in the city after dark. This took place in Eastern Europe, in a city with a tramway system. On one night, I found myself waiting at a tram station, waiting to catch the last tram that would take me home. There were three trams that stopped at this station, and two of them were headed in my direction. This detail becomes important later. It was around 10 p.m., and I was lost in thought as I sat there waiting. I barely noticed a man quietly walking up and standing near the shelter. At first, I thought nothing of it, assuming he was just another person waiting for the tram. However, as the minutes passed, a strange feeling began to creep over me. The streets were quiet and dark with no one else in sight except for me and this man. I wondered why he had chosen to stand so close to me when there was ample space to avoid other people. It seemed unusual for someone to strike up a conversation so late at night, especially given that I was not particularly so. I stole a glance at the man, trying not to overanalyze the situation. He was a bald, imposing figure, 
tall and built like a bear, with a big belly and muscular arms and legs. What alarmed me was not his physical presence, but the unblinking, expressionless stare he fixed on me. He made no effort to look away or act embarrassed. It was as if he wanted to make me uncomfortable. A sense of weakness washed over me, sending cold shivers down my spine. This situation was far from normal, and I realized I was in an uncomfortable position. Missing the last tram was not an option. Walking home was out of the question, and my phone was dead. I was a timid kid, and did not have the courage to scare this man away. I knew I had to try, so I mustered the courage to utter a small high, to startle him out of his disturbing behavior. However, my efforts failed in the face of his silent, threatening presence. He continued to stare, and it was clear he wanted me to feel my panic continued to rise, and I told myself to stay calm and think rationally. Minutes passed, but he maintained his unrelenting gaze. He relished my discomfort. Frustration began to replace my fear, and I decided that I would not let this man continue to enjoy my distress. I took a deep breath and attempted to reason with him, asking, What do you want? Stop staring. There was no response. He had heard me, and his intent was clear. Faced with his malicious silence, I knew I had to take control of the situation. As time passed, I realized that ignoring him was not working. I could not fight him off if he made a move, and there was nothing I could say or do to make him stop. I did not know his intentions, but they were not good. Walking away might lead to him following me, and running was not a feasible option, as he could easily catch up with his longer legs. Even if I managed to lose him, walking home through dark alleys, past potential dangers, was a risk I did not want to take. Pretending to call someone might provoke him to act sooner, making my situation worse. The only realistic option was to outsmart him. I began developing a few contingency plans, depending on which trams arrived and whether I could find any help. I could not let him know where I lived, so I had to be prepared to employ any available strategy if he followed me. I had to stay rational and aware of my surroundings. The first tram arrived, one that could have taken me home, but it would lead him to my neighborhood. I hoped he would board it and leave me alone, but he did not. He continued to watch me intently, and I sensed he was satisfied with how things were unfolding. I allowed the tram to depart, hoping it was not the last one heading. I endured another fifteen minutes, trying to formulate a new plan. I contemplated pretending to need a different tram, one going to a different part of the city and riding it to the next state. However, I had to be careful not to end up too far from my destination. As I continued pondering my options, the next tram arrived. My heart was in my throat as I boarded and took a seat near the door. The man got on as well, but he sat far from me at the back of the tram. I felt relieved, hoping that this would resolve. As the tram reached the next station, I got up and exited, not looking back. I hoped it was over, but when I reached the pavement and observed the tram driving away, I could not see the man inside. I slowly turned my head and was horrified to see him walking toward me, appearing slightly agitated. He stopped just a few steps away and resumed his intense stare, this time with a clear sense of malice, still not uttering a word. Tears of despair welled up in my eyes, but I could not cry, give up, or allow him to carry out his twisted plan. The possibility of what might happen was too real. My mind was filled with unanswered questions, regrets, and terrifying scenarios. I desperately wished I did not have to think anymore and could relinquish my composure, but I knew that doing so would be the signal for him to enact whatever plan he had in mind. Then, I saw the final tram approaching, the only one I could take now, and I boarded as quickly as my trembling legs allowed. With three stops left, I knew this was my chance. I took a seat near the front, trying to get the driver's attention, but he was an elderly man who remained blissfully unaware of my distress. We passed the first stop, and there was no one else waiting to board. I turned around, expecting to see the man following me again, but this time I was shocked to see him sitting right behind me. He was not taking any chances. He was making sure I would not attempt anything like before. I glared at him with anger, determined not to tolerate his behavior any longer. I got up and purposefully walked to another seat in the middle of the tram car, making it clear that I would not tolerate his action. He got up as well, and took a spot two seats behind and diagonally from me, wearing a slight arrogant grin. I anticipated his next move and stood by the middle door instead, making sure he could not predict which station I planned to exit. He remained where he was, convinced I was bluffing. This was the last tram, and he assumed there was no escape. 
My defiance seemed like an act to him. I decided to take a risk. I had no other choice. As the tram approached the next station, I let the doors open and remained still for the full five seconds before they began to close. Then, I bolted out and ran for it, reaching the back door and hitting the button to open it again. With adrenaline surging through my body, I waited for a painful second, jumped back inside, and crouched behind the nearest seat. I shut my eyes tightly and exhaled slowly, thanking the gods I did not believe in for that button. I hoped he had not seen me before I re-entered. The tram. I pictured him frantically searching for me, both on the tram and at the station. Was he still on the tram, his face contorted in anger as he scanned the surroundings? Or was he on the station's pavement, his mad eyes searching the darkness for me? The tram continued its journey, and I fought back tears as it rattled and clanged in rhythm with my pounding heart. With cautious optimism, I dared to smile, imagining his reaction when he realized he had made a mistake. With my hand on my chest, I did my best to discreetly look around the corner. I saw no one looking back. I stood up with excitement and threw myself at the foggy back window. There he was, standing alone on the station, looking helpless and defeated, watching me leave him and his sinister plans behind. Giving someone the middle finger had never felt so satisfying. I made it home and kept my story to myself, fearing I would be chastised for my naivety. But I was safe, proud of myself, and had learned a valuable lesson. To the creepy stranger, I hope that day taught you not to underestimate girls and deterred you from a life of criminality. Let us never meet again. Story 16 This story unfolds in the summer of 2023. I, my 17, and my friend F were hanging out at her house, discussing a shared passion of ours, Urbeck. While chatting, she mentioned an abandoned factory located just 30 minutes away from her home. Without hesitation, we grabbed our backpacks filled with cigarettes, food, and water, and set out on our adventure. We took occasional five-minute breaks as we made our way to the location. Upon arrival, we were immediately captivated by the eerie atmosphere and the complete absence of life in this place. Allow me to introduce the four buildings, as they will help you understand the rest of the story. The first building was locked and we had no further information about its purpose, but it served as a storage facility for wood and metal. The second building was the most significant, housing a large factory with three floors. It included a basement, a working space, and an eating area on the top floor. The third building was a wooden structure designed to house machinery and equipment. The fourth building was a small gas station that contained keys to other rooms. It had two floors, although we never ventured to the second floor, as you will soon discover. With excitement, we entered the second building, the big factory. Initially, we felt a sense of unease, but as time passed, we grew more comfortable in our surroundings. I will not deny that alcohol played a role in this. Then came the moment we could not resist. Curiosity got the best of us, and we found ourselves standing in front of a mysterious door. We opened it and descended into the basement. As we explored the room, we stumbled upon a small office with a cup of fresh coffee. At first, we dismissed it, thinking that other explorers like us had been here. We had not even begun to form theories when we heard something, a clown horn. We exchanged nervous glances and chuckled, attributing the sound to a toy or some other random object. But then, the clown horn sounded again, right behind us, followed by a sinister and traumatizing laugh. We sprinted toward the exit, fleeing the scene as fast as we could. We stood outside, trembling with fear. At this point, we struggled to believe what had just occurred, so we laughed it off with another sip of our beer. Soon after, we made the questionable decision to return to the site, fully aware of the potential risks. However, our second visit lasted less than five minutes before we spotted a hand opening the same basement door. That was the breaking point. We ran back home faster than I have ever run in my entire life. To emphasize the gravity of the situation, here is a crucial detail. About an hour later, while we were heading to a restaurant, we heard gunshots from the exact location of the abandoned factory. That night, we could not sleep at all, and to this day, I have never returned to that city. Story 17 I am not certain if my story belongs here, but it has always given me the creeps. I was a 25-year-old female at the time, and this happened in 2018 when I lived with my boyfriend, who is now my husband, 
in our hometown. It is a small city with some economic struggles and a few drug-related issues, partly due to a lack of activities. This Saturday night, my boyfriend had gone to his friend's house, which was about a 20-minute drive away, and he mentioned he would be home around 9. We lived in a duplex with separate upstairs and downstairs units. The building used to be a single large house converted into a duplex. My cousin rented the downstairs apartment, and she could be quite noisy. I was aware of when she was or was not home, and she was not home that night. Our street was arranged in such a way that the backs of the houses on my street and the parallel street all faced a narrow alley, and the driveways were mostly accessible through this alley. The downstairs unit had a front porch with a door and a side door, while our upstairs unit had the back door, which was at the top of an exterior wooden staircase. So, I was at home, watching TV alone, and I heard someone coming up the stairs and knocking on the door. It was only 8.30, and it would not have been unusual for my boyfriend to return early. They got tired of playing video games, or he just wanted to leave. I usually unlocked the door for him when he came home instead of him using his keys, especially in the dark, which could be a hassle. So, I got up and opened the door, fully expecting to find my boyfriend. To my shock, it was not my boyfriend at all. Instead, a thin man stood there, wearing oversized jeans and a hoodie. He had about four teeth and was swaying back and forth. I was so taken aback because I was certain it was my boyfriend returning home. The man at the door asked, Can I use your phone? Behind him, down the stairs and in the alley, I spotted a large SUV, a Ford Explorer type of vehicle, idling with someone in the driver's seat. Panic washed over me, and I simply replied, Yeah, hold on. I then closed and locked the door. The initial shock came from the fact that a stranger was at my door instead of my boyfriend. I hid, making sure he could not see me through the front door's window, and I felt frozen in place. Something just did not feel right about the situation. After a few minutes, I heard him descending the stairs. I cautiously approached the door and saw the car driving down the alley. I called my boyfriend told him what happened, and he said he would come home, even though he was about to leave anyway. After he arrived, I calmed down and honestly felt a bit silly. Why didn't I just lend him my phone? Was it really that weird? However, in the days that followed, I could not stop thinking about it. This happened in 2018. Between the two individuals, neither had a phone, and it was not as if they were experiencing car trouble. Why would they approach a stranger for a phone in a dark alley? behind a house, up a flight of stairs. They did not go to my cousin's front door downstairs, as I would have heard someone on the porch. They did not approach any other house, and I saw them leave the street entirely. Also, why would they go to a house to ask for a phone when there was no car in the driveway? To make things even more unsettling, our battery-powered security camera was dead at the time. I am genuinely unsure about what they wanted. If anyone has any ideas or thinks I might be overthinking it, please let me know. As for the creepy guy at my door, I hope we never meet again. Story 18 In the desolate embrace of rural Midwest, a decade ago, I dwelled in a house perched right off the highway, a dwelling sandwiched between towns, straddling the county line with its ominous circular driveway. A driveway leading straight to our barn, it followed while taking a sinister curve to the right led to the garage. One could continue past the garage, encircling the house, only to emerge where one started. The front facade of our house boasted two grand double doors, seldom graced by our presence. Our usual ingress was through the door nestled inside the garage. On a night steeped in darkness, the wail of a doorbell pierced the silence. My husband, our three-year-old daughter, and I lay wrapped in the cocoon of sleep. The intrusive chime roused me from my dreams, initially dismissed as figments of my slumber estate. Yet, the persistent ring persisted, awakening my husband after the third toll. The night was shrouded as the door creaked open, an apparition materialized. A young woman, veiled in her early twenties, an ordinary guise, marred only by the grotesque circumstance of her nocturnal visit. My gaze delved beyond her, discovering her vehicle parked askew in the driveway far from the house or the circular path. She pleaded to use our phone, citing the demise of her car's battery, rendering it inert. Skepticism clouded my judgment, unwilling to usher her into our sanctuary. The phone call to the county sheriff seemed a more prudent choice, an invocation of the unseen protector. She retraced her steps, 
vanishing into the night toward her dormant car, stationed some 50 feet away. My call to the police promised their imminent arrival in approximately 15 minutes, a duration that did not evoke urgency in their response or my anxiety. Just a girl stranded with a genuinely dead battery. The trunk popped open in futile attempts, darkness enveloping her endeavors. Then, the driver's door creaked ajar, and a male figure emerged. Following suit, the rear passenger door creaked open, and another male entity materialized. They delved into the trunk's mysteries, yet no gleam of light emerged. I strained but failed to decipher their hushed conversations and obscured actions. A clandestine council concluded with their retreat into the car's shroud. Five agonizing minutes elapsed, my silent prayers echoing for the swift arrival of the sheriff. Another ten minutes away, the car sat in ominous stillness, bereft of movement or light. Their presence inside the car was elusive. They had not traversed the front of the house under the beckoning dusk to dawn light. I thought I glimpsed the driver igniting a cigarette, though certainty eluded me. Then, an unexpected silhouette emerged. Approaching the car from the right, a man of unfamiliar countenance. Our nearest neighbors were miles away, and this interloper materialized from the recesses of my property, terminating at a creek. Undeterred, he sauntered beneath the oppressive dusk to dawn light, converging on the car without sparing a glance toward the house. He slipped into the back seat, igniting the car, as they reversed out of my driveway, heading north. The county sheriffs arrived ten minutes later, but my agitation had already reached its zenith. A fruitless search ensued, leaving us bereft of answers. Their inquiry into a license plate number proved futile, as the car lingered too far from our scrutiny. The authorities urged us to report any recurrence, an implausible expectation. My husband, fortified by his shotgun, sought refuge in sleep. The eerie trio never returned. Their enigmatic motives linger in the shadows, etched in the memory of a night when creepy figures in an operational car materialized at our doorstep. May we remain forever unacquainted with such unsettling in- Story 19 In the heart of my town, Halloween was revered, a grand spectacle where each house competed to terrify children and outdo one another with the best candy. This year, the mantle of trick-or-treating independence finally descended upon my friends, Ashley, Sherry, and me. Preparations were a day-long affair, perfecting our vampire, witch, and werewolf costumes. Midway through my bloody embellishments, Ashley's gasp pierced the excitement. What's wrong? I inquired, my gaze steadfast on the mirror. It's snowing. Halloween, a sacred tradition, now faced an unforeseen challenge. Snow, a rarity etched in the annals of my town's history. A childhood event a decade ago loomed in memory, etching a sinister significance. The elders, in the days leading to Halloween, instilled the rules, engraving them in our minds. Masks off for candy, an inexplicable dictate echoing through generation. Sherry, adorned in a werewolf mask, bore the burden of compliance. Jovial jests about her mask's complexity aside, we embarked on our venture, assured that Ashley's mom, less inclined to nag, would offer a cursory reminder at the door. My mom, a fervent nagger, disrupted my reverie with a phone call. Hastily, I preempted her queries, spewing assurances and obligatory adherence to the rules, ending the call with a chuckle at parental predictability. With scrutinized costumes and burgeoning excitement, we spilled onto the snowy neighborhood, planning to navigate the darker, eerier houses. Ashley, harboring a crush on Josh and his friends, speculated about their presence, a thought I dismissed as we approached the first house. As the night unfurled, Sherry mastered the swift removal of her mask, a commendable feat, despite its repetitive nature. The last house, renowned for lavish candy largesse, awaited. A peculiar encounter awaited us. A masked scarecrow lingering in the company of Sherry. Trick or treat, we chorused. The woman at the door, benevolent yet cautious, invited us to take two bars, but demanded masks be removed. A second masked child, a scarecrow with jagged eye holes and stitched mouth, stood beside Sherry. My unease intensified, dismissing it as a candy-seeking child before grabbing my share. As Sherry hesitated, Ash urged her. Unaware of the looming dread, Sherry addressed the scarecrow, oblivious to the unspoken rule. Panic etched the woman's face as she withdrew her offering. Run, she whispered, slamming the door shut. Our screams echoed into the night. 
propelled by terror we could not comprehend. Turning the corner, the scarecrow loomed close, its vacant eye holes piercing the shadows. Faster, I urged, racing toward Ashley's house, safely a distant door away. A cacophony of straw rustling intensified as we fled, the scarecrow trailing behind. The illuminated porch promised refuge Ashley grappled with the locked door, our panic palpable. Keys fumbled Sherry and I pounded, pleading for entry. A deafening bang resonated, accompanied by window assault. The crumpled note on the side table revealed Ashley's solitude. Fear enveloped us, heightened by another resounding bang on the door. A barricade formed, desperation etched on our faces. We have to hide. I declared, leading them upstairs. A closet became our refuge as the relentless assault persisted, a symphony of banging on windows and doors. Hours of torment ensued, our breaths stifled, our prayers desperate. As the clock struck midnight, the assault ceased, leaving us in deafening silence. Silent minutes transpired before we dared to unseal our sanctuary. We had survived the night, emerging from the closet into the spectral quiet of November 1 forever haunted by the Scarecrow's malevolent pursuit. Story 20 With Halloween's approach, I am vividly reminded of a chilling encounter that has haunted me to this day. This tale, though extensive, serves as a stark reminder of how seemingly harmless decisions made in our youth can lead to perilous situations. The unsettling events took place during my first year in high school, precisely on Halloween night. My circle of friends and I had not reached the age where we were invited to Halloween parties, and we deemed ourselves too mature for the tradition of trick-or-treat. We were a close-knit group of five girls who had known each other since infancy, residing in a secluded, wooded area on the outskirts of town. To set the scene, this region was remote and heavily forested. One of my friends, whom we will refer to as T, had parents who raised chickens on a sprawling 50-acre property, complete with chicken houses. We frequently explored this vast domain on our four-wheeler after school. In the lead-up to that fateful night, excitement and meticulous planning consumed us. In our small town, one of the more daring activities was known as rolling yards. If you are unfamiliar with the term, it involves hurling rolls of toilet paper into trees, causing the paper to drape down like eerie streamers. This practice served various purposes, from classic pranks to expressing admiration or seeking vengeance amid girl dramata. Sneaking down a pitch-black rural road, turning into a long, gravel driveway, and fearing the consequences of discovery evoked an inexplicable rush of adrenaline. If caught, not only would our parents be informed, but we would also be tasked with cleaning up the mess the following day. Two weeks before Halloween, my friends and I decided that we would embark on a Halloween escapade with the primary objective of rolling the eerie house situated along the rural road where T resided. This house had been the subject of countless frightening tales amongst us for years. During our afternoon strolls after school, we would pass it often. No one ever seemed to enter or exit the house, but T's parents had issued a stern warning to steer clear of the area. Looking back, T's mother worked in law enforcement, and her motives for keeping us away were far more sinister than what she initially disclosed. The night's plan was simple T's older sister B, then 17 years old, would drive us to the local Walmart after T's parents had retired for the night. B and B was the type of cool, older sibling who enthusiastically participated in our escapades and considered chaperoning us during our wild endeavors enjoyable. All five of us squeezed into the back seat of B's car, piling on top of each other, blasting our favorite 2000 hip-hop tunes as we sped along the narrow, winding two-lane road a prospect that seems perilous in retrospect. But, thankfully, no mishaps occurred. Around 11.30 p.m., we parked in the empty Walmart lot and proceeded to the toilet paper aisle, our spirits soaring with adrenaline. We filled two shopping carts to the brim with 99-cent rolls of toilet paper, exchanging furtive giggles as the cashier eyed us suspiciously during checkout. Giddy with excitement, we raced back to B's car, popped the trunk, and stashed the multitude of toilet paper rolls inside. As we headed back toward T's remote hometown, beyond city limits, we hushed the music to outline the mission's detail. B would park along a dirt road leading to some cow pastures a mile from the driveway of our target, Mr. S. Our group of five would divide into teams, walking quietly along the forest edge, ready to drop to the ground and conceal ourselves in the event a car approached. We clutched our arms full of toilet paper rolls and advanced toward Mr. S's lengthy gravel driveway. 
Adrenaline pounded in our ears. While the crickets provided a deafening symphony, pardon my descriptive flourish, but I vividly relived the experience. We advanced to within about ten yards of the driveway's entrance, unburdened ourselves of the toilet paper we carried, and retreated quietly toward B's car to fetch the next load. Once all the toilet paper was amassed at our designated checkpoint near the forest's edge, we each collected four rolls and entered the woods on either side of the gravel driveway. In whispers, we urged each other to remain silent, knowing that discovery would spell disaster. Finally, we discerned a faint light emanating from the side of Mr. S.'s garage, and it filled me with a sense of dread like I had never experienced before. The house, already disconcerted in daylight, appeared a thousand times more sinister. The prospect of encountering the man we had been explicitly warned to avoid was nauseating. T, the boldest and most audacious among us, decided to make a beeline for the garage along the edge of the wood. We watched her in shock as she positioned herself near the forest's edge, signaling to us that no lights shone within the house, and Mr. S was asleep inside. I stood rooted in place, fearing that my trembling legs might betray me, but another girl gestured toward a tall oak tree at the very front of Mr. S's house which was, regrettably, my assigned target. I decided my loyalty to my team outweighed my fear and, ripping open a pack of toilet paper, hurled it toward the highest branch of the tree, watching as the streamers of white paper fluttered in the wind. Soon, white tendrils descended from every tree surrounding the house, and our growing audacity intensified as our courage grew. Suddenly, T froze in her tracks and let out a loud hush. I halted, concealing myself behind a tree, my heart lodged in my throat and noticed lights within the house flickering to life out of the corner of my eye. T then whispered, shouted, run, and we abandoned our remaining rolls of toilet paper, bolting into the pitch black forest. Another girl in our group tripped and fell behind me, and I turned to a sister when I heard it. Several gunshots rang out, shattering the silence, and Mr. S's voice echoed manically through the night. You fools think you're clever. Not so amusing when I find you. We kept running, all of us crying, our hearts racing from the adrenaline in our frantic pace. As we neared the driveway's entrance, we heard something even more unsettling than gunshots, the rumble of a diesel truck engine approaching slowly. We hastily retreated into the woods, concealing ourselves as we silently prayed not to be detected. Mr. S parked his truck about thirty yards away and killed the engine. An eerie silence descended upon us. I had a clear view of him from my vantage point and he carried a shotgun slung over his shoulder as he advanced to the opposite side of the driveway, his eyes scanning the surroundings intently. In that harrowing moment, we were on the brink of discovery and, quite possibly, a gruesome fate. Only B knew our whereabouts. Our parents lay in slumber, blissfully ignorant of our dangerous predicament. I strained to stifle my sobs and sniffles, desperate to avoid making any noise. Then, I witnessed Mr. S's shadow raising the shotgun into the air and firing a shot. I nearly fainted, my fear becoming unbearable. I observed car lights further up the road from the driveway, which ignited a fresh wave of panic. I wondered whether the lights would reveal our hidden presence in the woods. The car, however, slowed down, and it became apparent that it was B. 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 rolled down her window and spoke loudly to someone from her open car window, providing what I assumed was Mr. S's address to the police. This enraged him and he charged toward her car for a moment, only to retreat, cursing vehemently and brandishing his gun in the air. As soon as Mr. S turned his truck around and headed back toward his house, we sprinted toward B's car and clambered inside. We were crying uncontrollably, unable to speak, our bodies drenched in sweat. None of us uttered a word as we wept the entire way back to T's house, showered, and wept well into the night and morning. We kept the incident a secret from T and B's parents, and we never discussed it among ourselves for years. We never engaged in rolling again, to say the least. What had begun as a juvenile prank had transformed into one of the most terrifying episodes of my teenage years. Given our remote location and our fear of the consequences of our actions B later revealed, about a week after the incident, that she had fabricated the 911 call. It is a chilling thought. All I can say is that we were fortunate that night. Some guardian angels must have been watching over us, Looking back, B should have genuinely summoned the authorities. We were naive youngsters more concerned about getting into trouble than comprehending the risks we were exposing ourselves to, including the possibility of harm or to Mr. S.
I will never understand why a few rolls of toilet paper hanging from your trees drove you to such anger and violence, but I hope to never encounter you again. Story 21 As the familiar specter of Halloween loomed over my school, our annual Halloween party beckoned. However, my friends and I, ever curious and drawn to the mysterious, embarked on a peculiar quest that fateful night. Whispers of a haunted theater, harboring a restless spirit, had ignited our collective intrigue. Clad in dark attire, we stealthily infiltrated the theater amid the bustling Halloween party. Determined to explore the veracity of the long-standing rumors, our covert journey unfolded through dimly lit hallways, hearts pounding not from supernatural fear, but from the apprehension of encountering vigilant faculty member. In the inky blackness, we descended the central staircase, each step resonating like a thunderclap in our ears. The theater's double doors beckoned, and to our astonishment, they opened smoothly, revealing a corridor cloaked in darkness. Our purposeful strides took us to the stage, the presumed epicenter of spectral light. Equipped with the camera, I intended to capture our surroundings. However, the camera initially refused to cooperate, delaying our quest. Finally activated, the camera's flash pierced the pervasive darkness, offering a fleeting glimpse of the backstage corridor. A disconcerting revelation awaited us in the developed image, a shadowy figure peering from behind the dividing wall, its expression a haunting blend of fear and curiosity. A shared unease enveloped us as we cautiously advanced down the corridor, uncertain of what led. The journey concluded in a small room at the stage's edge, noticeably cold due to the intrusion of frigid October air. A second photograph, taken with trembling hands, unveiled a face, pallid and distorted, with long, straight black hair. The features defied normalcy, and my friends appeared oblivious to this grotesque visage in the captured image. Dread consumed me as a soft whisper echoed in my ear. Leave now. A shockwave coursed through my spine, propelling me toward the stage. Urgently, we retraced our steps, pushing against a stubborn door. As we fled into the night, confusion lingered over an unexplained presence, a mysterious force that defied comprehension. Seated at the bus stop, silence prevailed among us. None dared to articulate the inexplicable events that transpired within the haunted theater. The ride home carried an air of solemnity, and when I reached my house, the forest path, illuminated by lights, appeared menacing. As I encountered my father's questioning gaze, I fabricated a tale of a lackluster party and a jog up the hill. In the solitude of my room, I cracked open a book, attempting to dispel the lingering unease. However, the night brought forth a dreadful nightmare, leaving me with haunting words. He can't disturb us any longer. The following morning, I awoke to physical distress, and the subsequent days unfolded in an uneasy silence. The theater, once a realm of curiosity, transformed into a source of nervous trepidation. A chilling secret held within, a tale concealed from others, marked that fateful Halloween night. As the days passed, a disquieting sense of change lingered, a harbinger of an altered reality yet to unfold. Story 22 This chilling incident unfolded after our Halloween party, lingering into the early hours of the morning, with the last remnants of guests departing around 3 a.m. As I relaxed on the front porch, an unfamiliar guy emerged, diligently cleaning up the aftermath of cans and cigarette butts. While not entirely unusual in our city setting, his presence raised some eyebrows. He was not visibly homeless, yet it was evident he was grappling with challenging times hopeful for tips. I found myself without cash, but my roommate Mike generously went inside to fetch some change for the diligent cleaner. Although the amount was modest, I stayed behind, offered him a cigarette, and initiated a conversation. During our exchange, he shared the hardships of finding employment on parole, clinging to whatever work came his way. A disheartening incident at a pizza shop where he had been promised a small reward, only to receive a quarter and a soda painted a vivid picture of his struggle as the last remaining occupants. It eventually became bedtime for me, still buzzing from the party. Lying in bed, scrolling on my phone, thirty minutes later, an unexpected voice pierced the silence, emanating from within my house, downstairs. Mike, you got the soda. Alarmed, I hurried downstairs, noticing the unusual closure of the door leading from the kitchen to the mudroom. 
a door we never shut. There is another door from the mudroom to the outside, typically left ajar. Filled with trepidation, I decided to fetch my roommate. Together, we approached the mudroom door. Bracing myself, I announced my intent to open it, urging whoever was there to leave. Gathering courage, I swung the door open, only to find an empty space on the other side. Strangely, the door leading outside was wide open. My heart raced with fear. I swiftly closed and locked the door to the outside and ensured the front door was securely latched. While testing the front door's knob, I heard the man from outside say, I'm still here, just sitting outside. The unnerving part was that he had specifically asked Mike, you got the soda. This inquiry followed his account of being shortchanged with a quarter and a soda for sweeping. Mike had indeed given him some change. The bone-chilling realization that he had somehow entered my house gripped me with unease, casting a shadow over the mundane encounter. Story 23 This unnerving virtual encounter revolves around a TikTok account that took a dark and disturbing turn. The account's first post, innocently showcasing a decaying pumpkin through shaky camera work, seems harmless at first. However, the unsettling twist begins to unfold in subsequent videos. On the seventh day of the account's existence, six more videos were posted, sending shivers down the spine. The first two depict an empty road surrounded by trees, dimly lit by a solitary street lamp. Faint singing and voices can be heard in the background as the camera person walks. The third video reveals something wrapped in a plaid blanket lying on the forest floor, with the person filming kicking leaves onto the bundle. The unsettling journey continues as the man is seen dragging a small blue suitcase leaking blood as he drags it along, tightly bound with duct tape and containing something deeply disturbing. The fifth video takes a chilling turn as the man approaches the edge of a bridge, one sock on, visibly soaking wet. A trail of blood leads to a large patch, revealing the suitcase sitting on the ledge. In a macabre act, the man's gloved hand pushes the suitcase off the bridge into the water. Accompanied by the eerie background song It's So Hard to Say Goodbye by Kenny Vance and the Planotones. The sixth and final video from that night showcases the man's terrifying drawings. What makes this even more disturbing are his hands, visibly shaky and covered in scratches. These scratches add a layer of reality to the situation, making it feel much more authentic than a mere creative project. The videos on this TikTok account leave an indelible mark of unease and uncertainty. Story 24 When I was young, I visited a house in town where the residents went all out for Halloween, spending thousands of dollars to make the place perfect. This place was incredibly well done, and I mean it was exceptionally impressive, even as an adult. It could compete with professional haunted houses. It was either 1999 or 2000 because I dressed up as Darth Maul. I remembered being really scared in the previous years, so I hoped that my character's badassery would give me some courage. They had blocked off the area with a black tarp and had everything you would expect to see at such a house. A psycho shower scene with a zombie crawling out of a toilet, ghouls and imps climbing trees, blood, gore, strobes, fog, and more. I was still terrified even with my double lightsaber. Despite being scared out of my wits to walk through it, I always admired the craftsmanship because I knew the props. They had been either expensive or required significant effort to make. To this day, I have never seen a yard as horrifying as there. Every year, I saw the house owners sitting on their porch, enjoying the terror they brought to the neighborhood and handing out candy. So, as I nervously crossed the yard past flying banshees and impaled corpses, I noticed the main attraction at the end of the line. There, on what I assume was the driveway, was the bottomless pit attraction. The illusion bewildered and chilled me. Though it was only lit by a single light bulb, it made the box glow like a low-burning furnace. I must have stared at it for a while when suddenly I heard a cough and a low, hushed voice to my right. I do not recall exactly what was said, but it was something like, Hey, check this out or hey, I want to show you something, in a gruff, hoarse tone. I looked over and at first, I saw nothing but the wide gate to what was clearly the side of the owner's house. There was just a faint amount of light from the glowing pit to outline the gated fence. After my eyes adjusted, I noticed a figure standing completely still. In fact, it was so still that I initially thought it was another static prop. My young mind could not process much, and I was still searching for the source of the voice I heard, not realizing it had come from the figure. 
whom I could barely make out. After a few moments, I heard the voice again. I realized it came from the figure and began to approach it. This was, of course, a foolish idea, but compared to everything else happening around me, this figure seemed far less menacing. So, I cautiously moved closer, trying to understand it. Suddenly, the figure started to move, and I froze in place. The amber glow lit up his face just enough for me to discern his features. This part I remember vividly. It was a scruffy and rough-looking man with a coarse, gray beard and yellowed teeth. His weathered and tattered clothing appeared as though it had not been cleaned in ages. He was smiling at me, for reasons I could not fathom, but it deeply unsettled me under the eerie light of the bulb behind me. It just felt wrong. It was as if, in that moment, I gained some clarity and realized that his presence here was clearly not part of the show. Since I had already seen the owners, it was obvious he did not belong on the property. I screamed and ran out as fast as I could, not daring to look back. I might have attracted some curious glances from the other kids, but as I found my parents waiting outside, I told them about the man I had encountered. One of the owners approached and asked if everything was all right. I said something like, I didn't like the old man by the gate. He looked at me for a moment and asked, What man? I never let us not meet the creepy shadowy man. Story 25 Sophomore year of college. Oh, the memories. October arrived, and it was time to embrace the spooky season, attend parties, and dress up. Halloween was my favorite holiday. About a week before Halloween, one night, my Tinder date was canceled due to studying for an exam. I was in a foul mood, and I did not want to hang out with friends in their dorm to get drunk. So, I decided to play some basketball at a secluded park. Basketball always helped me relax, and shooting around for about an hour sounded like the perfect way to unwind before heading back to my place to play video games. I arrived at the park as expected, and there was not a single car in sight. There was a nearby trail leading to a mountain, probably where all the stoners hung out, I thought with a chuckle. It was a great time to shoot some hoops and de-stress. I contemplated putting in headphones, but as night approached, I decided it was best to stay aware of my surrounding. As the sun set, a beautiful pink sky painted the scene perfectly. After another 15 minutes, darkness fell, and I planned to wrap up my basketball session soon. However, just as I was thinking about leaving, a loud, piercing scream echoed through the area, coming from the nearby trail. It was followed by eerie laughter. I was spooked but could not see anything, so I told myself to stay for another 10 minutes. Then, a car pulled into the parking lot and parked. I decided to use the nearby bathroom before leaving. While I was in there, I heard a whisper coming from one of the stalls, repeatedly saying, Clowns. My heart raced, and I knew I had to get out of there. It could be a troubled person, a homeless individual, or worse. As I left the bathroom, I realized there was someone nearby, but it was not anyone I knew. A car door slammed shut, and I decided to peek behind the small building housing the bathrooms to see who had just gotten out of the car. What I saw shocked me to my core. Two clowns were walking slowly toward the basketball courts and then towards the nearby trail. I thought about following them to see where they were going, but I quickly dismissed that idea as unwise. I grabbed my backpack and prepared to walk back to my car. I made my way to the car, hopped in, and started making a phone call to tell my friends that I would be online in about an hour. Then, I noticed someone sitting on a bench near the court. I thought it might be the person from the bathroom. I had had enough at that point. I drove off and headed back to my place to relax. It could have been much worse if I had followed those two clowns into the dark trail. The clown sightings in 2016 were undeniably creepy. It was a strange time in many parts of the country, and I had even heard about it happening in other parts of the world. This was just a creepy encounter I wanted to share. Who knows, those clowns will come back. Story 26 In May 2017, my husband Jim and I owned a five-story, hundred-year-old building that housed our business, an antique mall on the main floor, our apartment upstairs, and various other tenants. Over the prior years, we have experienced several back-to-back -back burglaries, prompting us to fortify the front doors of our business with steel bars and additional camera. At 3 a.m. one fateful night, we were sound asleep upstairs when we received a call from Sonatrol, our security company. 
The motion detector had been triggered in an unusual location, not on the main floor where most of our valuable jewelry was kept, but downstairs. Typically, such alarms were caused by a spider on the camera or some other minor disturbance. We rushed to respond, unprepared for what awaited us. I was only dressed in a tank top and underwear, with flip-flops on my feet. Jim, at least, had put on pants. I went to check the intact front door, while Jim headed in the opposite direction to inspect the rear of the building. Suddenly, Jim called out. Someone's inside. I fumbled with my phone, desperately trying to dial. In that terrifying moment, my instinctual panic overtook me, and my phone felt like a complex piece of technology. Eventually, I managed to call for help while describing the situation to the 9111 operator. The noise of breaking glass and shattering windows echoed through the building. It was like everything inside was being ruthlessly destroyed. Listening to someone vandalize your livelihood is an indescribable feeling. Questions raced through my mind. Who was in there? How many of them? What havoc were they causing? All I could do was shout into the phone, pleading with the faceless voice for help that seemed agonizingly far away. Keep in mind, I had been abruptly awakened to a terrifying situation, barely clothed, and it was escalating rapidly. As it turned out, Jim had come face to face with the intruder Troy, as he was attempting to exit through the broken window, just before I arrived. They locked eyes, and Jim exclaimed, Oh crap, prompting Troy to retreat into the depths of the building. Troy dropped his stolen merchandise-laden backpack, vaulted over a massive iron gate, smashed through the door of the restaurant tenant, and then exited through their main door. At this point, Troy had sustained numerous cuts from the shattered glass and was bleeding profusely. Jim chased him down and tackled him forcefully, pinning Troy to the ground. Adrenaline was coursing through our veins. I was still on the phone with the 9111 operator, urgently begging them to hurry. I feared that I might witness my husband's death. I rushed towards the scuffle, driven by adrenaline, as you tend to do in such intense moments. They were in the middle of the street, dimly illuminated by the orange glow of streetlights, making it difficult to discern the details of the struggle. Fortunately, Troy was unarmed and ill-prepared for the madman who had tackled him in the darkness. Unbeknownst to us at the time, Troy had committed hundreds of burglaries without ever being caught. Jim had the upper hand and held him down, while Troy wisely feigned surrender. Suddenly, the roar of an engine and the screeching of tires filled the air. I started screaming in response to the approaching danger. It was Troy's getaway driver, his wife Kelsey, who leaned out of her window and threatened, get the heck off him or I'm going to harm you. This threat was clearly captured on audio, but I have no recollection of it. Kelsey, unwilling to wait, attempted to run me over. I vaguely remember realizing that the situation was spiraling out of control but desperately trying to read the license plate number aloud into the phone. My focus, laser-like and idiotic, the plate was from out of state, and I struggled to make it out. That is all I can recall. My brain seemed to block out just how close she had come to turning me into a bloody mess, missing me by only about a foot as she sped by. I dodged her vehicle, clutching my phone in sheer terror. A year later, in the prosecutor's office, we had to listen to the 911 recording while watching the video footage from a nearby business with high-quality exterior cameras. Jim began to cry. He had no idea just how close he came to serious harm. At one point, the sound of the engine revving drowned out my frantic screaming. My voice was nearly gone, and I was chanting the license plate number like a desperate incantation, but it was barely audible due to the deafening noise. Jim eventually released Troy, who quickly jumped into the car, and they sped away. The police arrived about a minute later, but the culprits had already vanished. Afterward, Troy's blood was all over Jim from the door's shattered glass. Jim was deeply shaken by the experience. We suspected that Troy was using intravenous drugs, which later proved to be correct, and I had to inspect Jim for cuts, using a flashlight to ensure we did not miss any injuries. He underwent testing for any potential health concerns. This incident was treated with the seriousness it deserved, given the substantial evidence, the violence involved, and the attempted murder. Several months later, both Troy and Kelsey were arrested. Troy's DNA was found on the bloody clothes Jim had been wearing and all over the stolen car they had used, which had been ditched. It turned out that the couple was wanted in five different counties for hundreds of commercial burglaries over several years, all to support their addiction to oxycodone. We were their only mistake. They had not known we lived on the premises. Kelsey, Troy's wife, decided to cooperate with the authorities. She reached a plea deal, 
much to my dissatisfaction since she had attempted to kill me. Nevertheless, she provided valuable information that incriminated Troy on numerous counts. Troy, on the other hand, refused to plead deal. He insisted on going to trial, a prospect I would not wish on my worst enemy. During the trial, I was interviewed by the defense team, who, unbeknownst to me, could lie during these one-on-one -on -one interviews. They refrained from dishonesty in front of the jury, but in private, they sought to exploit any weaknesses. I had no legal representation. I was on the prosecution's team. While I could theoretically understand the purpose, it was still deeply frustrating. They began by interviewing me. They played the 9111 tape for me, the second time I had heard it. They insisted that because I had referred to the intruder as they, I was lying about the presence of another person besides Troy and Kelsey. I explained that I used they as a non-gendered pronoun since I had not yet seen the individual. Subsequently, they interviewed Jim. They falsely told him that I had admitted to lying and claiming there was another person inside the building. Jim, luckily, saw through their deception and vehemently denied it. Finally, a day before the trial was set to begin, Troy accepted a plea deal, much to our relief. I had been spiraling into the most pointless concerns, whether I should change my hair color from purple. I had just spent $700 on it. What conservative shoes to wear and how to hide my tattoos. I was grasping at trivial things because the trial was looming and I had little control over it. Kelsey received probation, while Troy served time in prison from 2017 to 2020, before an early release due to the COVID-19 pandemic. As of now, Kelsey is living a clean and normal life, remarried with children, and appears happy. I occasionally wish her some minor inconveniences, but I am no saint. Story 27 This incident occurred 16 years ago, but it has lingered in my memory because it left me both terrified and feeling foolish. I reside in Honduras, a country with its share of issues, primarily violence and poverty. Growing up, I had become accustomed to the normalization of troubling things, one of which was the practice of families marrying off their daughters to wealthy suitors. Sometimes, this involved pressuring daughters to entertain the advances of affluent individuals, while other times it felt like outright sexual trafficking, especially in families where one parent was absent. This practice was more common in small towns, but not unheard of in larger areas. My family tried to shield my siblings and me from the darker aspects of life here. Our parents worked diligently to provide us with a good education, a safe living environment, and raised us to be cautious and avoid places where we were not supposed to be. My mother owned a cafe in a port town, and many of her customers were tourists and foreigners passing through on their way to their vacation villas or beach houses. Among them was an older American, whom my parents had befriended through casual conversation on a few occasions. They even invited our family to his beach house for a cookout. He always appeared friendly, exuding a kind and gentle aura. He even bore a resemblance to Santa Claus. One day, while I was taking his order, he asked me to sit down with him. We discussed my school and post-graduation plans, and nothing initially raised any red flags in my mind. I assumed he was simply bored and looking for someone to chat with until my mom returned from her break. Then things took a disturbing turn. He began commenting on my family's recent financial difficulties, primarily related to debts and my dad's inability to work due to an accident. I nodded along, thinking that my parents had sought his help or a loan. However, he revealed that he was talking about me going with him to the United States, where I had a visa, and assisting him while living with him. He made inappropriate remarks about my appearance, suggesting that everyone would rather wait until I graduated, which was only a few months away, but that my family needed help immediately. He argued that it would not be appropriate for him to step in if we were not his family, so if we got married soon, he would take care of everyone. I was dumbfounded and could only manage to murmur something like, No, thank you, sir. He told me I did not need to decide right away but suggested we go on a weekend boat trip to see if we got along. He claimed that my parents were uncertain about the situation, but had chosen not to inform me because they wanted me to finish school and make my own choice. He then twisted the narrative, saying that, as the eldest, I needed to look after my siblings, and since my parents had cared for me, I should now take care of them. At this point, I felt a sinking feeling in my stomach because it seemed as though he had genuinely discussed taking me away with my parents and they were considering it. I started negotiating with him. I asked if I could bring someone along on the weekend boat trip, 
and if I could finish high school in the United States, among other conditions, all while holding back tears. He calmed me down and assured me that my parents had already said no, but he suggested that I think about it and wait for them to bring it up. He also made me promise not to tell them that he had informed me first, emphasizing that I needed to prove to him that he could... As it turned out, he was completely insincere. He did not mention the idea with my parents until two days after he had talked to me. My mom immediately rejected the proposal, and he insisted that she should inquire about my opinion. My mom refused, stating that I would finish school, go to college, and then decide the course of my life. This revelation occurred during dinner, two full days after my conversation with the old man, and I burst into tears, confessing everything to my parents. So, yes, I felt like the biggest fool in the world for believing, even momentarily, that my parents would simply hand me over like a sack of potatoes but I was immensely relieved that they had my best interests at heart. So, wherever you are, creepy Santa, let us not meet again. Story 28 I confess that I am addicted to this subreddit. I spend two or more hours a day reading the posts, so I decided to share my own story. This incident took place when I was around 12 years old, my family and I lived in a small apartment that, despite its size, felt cozy to me. We knew some of our neighbors and occasionally invited them to our home. They were wonderful people. At the time, I slept next to my brother's bed, and his presence made me feel safe, as if nothing could go wrong. The only unsettling thing about our apartment was that our bedroom was adjacent to our neighbor's bedroom, which was slightly higher than ours. To see their room, you could stand on a chair, while they could effortlessly view our entire bedroom. While it was creepy, I did not think much about it because, as I mentioned earlier, I had the comfort of my brother sleeping in the same room as me. Oh, how innocent I was. The day everything began, I had just finished dinner and decided to go to bed early, with my brother not in the room at the time. Everything seemed fine until I woke up and saw something that still sends shivers down my... I witnessed a silhouette of a person right next to the window. While I could not see their faces at all, I knew they were staring at me. I screamed as loudly as I could and ran desperately to the living room, where my mom was watching TV. I explained what had happened, but she did not seem bothered in the least. She simply replied with an O, oh, OK, and resumed watching TV as though nothing had occurred. A few days after that incident, I began feeling better about it, but I decided to keep the curtains closed, just in case. Until one night, I woke up in the middle of the night and inexplicably had the urge to open the curtains. As you might expect, she was there, staring at me once again. Just like the first time, I could not see her face, only a dark figure. I do not know how many times she did this, but for the next several days, I would wake up Tuominous three times every night. Even with the curtains always closed, I had a persistent feeling that she was there, watching me sleep. A few days later, I decided to confide in my parents, and that's when things took a creepy turn. They informed me that an elderly woman, living right next to our apartment, was ill and had her son taking care of her. They mentioned that when they left to take out the trash, she would follow behind them and smile, patiently waiting for them to turn around. I tried to explain how paranoid I felt, convinced that she was constantly watching me, but they brushed it off with something like, she's a sick old lady. Scary people are the highlight of her week. Just ignore her and continue sleeping. While I do not dwell on it much these days, I remember being quite upset with my parents. Why weren't they helping me? I followed their advice, ignoring her every night while keeping the curtains closed. It took some time, but I eventually began to forget about the experience. Then, a few weeks later, things took a darker turn. From my mother's perspective, our family was always different from others. She worked all day, while my dad was at home with us, taking us to school and picking us up. One day, while waiting for my dad to pick me up from school, a friend approached me and offered to take me home in her dad's car. I completely forgot that my dad was coming to get me, so I accepted her offer and got in the car. When I arrived home, I knocked on the door, but apart from my two dogs barking, there was no response. I became anxious, so I kept knocking repeatedly until I heard a loud noise coming from the elderly woman's apartment next door. It was then that I realized I had made a grave mistake. As soon as I heard the sound, I raced to the elevator and pressed the buttons incessantly. Our elevator had a window at the center and I was terrified that she might appear in it, but luckily, she did not. After exiting the building, 
I chose to lay down on the street, attempting to process what had just happened. My friend spotted me and invited me to her house. I was watching cartoons when her dad called me to explain why I had not arrived at school. When my dad arrived, I ran to him and embraced him, crying. He reassured me, saying, It's okay now. My brother's school typically ended 30 minutes after mine, so we had to return to school to collect him. During the entire journey, I was dreading my father's reprimand, but to my surprise, he remained very calm. He suggested that he was thinking of buying a cell phone so that I could message him if anything. After that experience, I became even more frightened of the elderly woman. I continued to keep the curtains closed, and I got used to the situation. Eventually, we moved to a different house, and I never saw that woman again. Not that I would have been able to recognize her, as every time I saw her at the window, her face was entirely black. That concludes my story. Fortunately, I did not have to see what she looked like. I realize that my story may not be as compelling as some others I have read, but I hope you enjoyed it. I apologize if some parts are unclear. English is not my first... Story 29 this incident occurred when I was 17 years old, just on the verge of graduating high school. I was homeschooled and highly encouraged to pursue entrepreneurship. At the time, I was working on establishing a photography business that I could run after graduation. To build my portfolio, I decided to ask a few friends and acquaintances to model for me, including a girl I worked with and her husband. It seemed like a win-win situation. They would receive free photos, and I could use them as sample work on my website. We planned a day to meet, and I asked them to join me at a local park one evening. You should know that this park was quite far out in the countryside. It featured soccer fields, baseball fields, a golf course, and walking trails, covering a large expanse of land and offering relative seclusion. The only house in view of the park was the caretaker's home, directly across the street from the entrance. Unless there was an event or a weekend, the park was usually not very crowded. I felt confident about meeting the couple there because I planned to arrive about 15 minutes early to set up, so I would not be alone for long. The park had an entrance that led to a parking lot, offering access to all the sports fields, the playground, and the pond. At the front of the park, there was a large grassy area where I intended to set up for my photo. I bypassed the main entrance and pulled into a small dirt section at the front of the park, starting to unload my props. Being a cautious person, especially as a young woman, I took a quick look around to check if anyone else was at the park. I noticed one car in the parking lot and two guys playing catch on the baseball field with their pit bull. Across the street, I could see the caretaker in her yard, which made me feel more at ease. I decided to keep an eye out while setting it up. I would glance up every now and then to ensure the two men were still on the baseball field. I had no reason to believe they would bother me, but something in my gut told me to stay vigilant. The couple I was expecting seemed to be running late and I completed my setup while occasionally checking on the two guy. To my horror, I realized they had disappeared. Their car remained, but the men and their dog were nowhere in sight. There was a slight hill in front of me that obscured part of the park entrance from view, so I considered the possibility that they had decided to take a walk on one of the nature trail. Yet, that nagging feeling in my gut persisted, hinting that something was wrong. I looked at the caretaker's house, and she had gone back inside. I could not pack up everything in my car quickly, so I grabbed my camera equipment, hopped into the car, locked the doors, started the engine, and got my phone ready. Just as I had settled into my car, I saw the two guys coming over the hill with their dog. My gut quickly turned to panic. You must understand that there was no logical reason for them to approach where I was. It was simply an open, grassy yard. If the dog needed to relieve itself, there were plenty of places closer to them such as the wood's edge, the nature trail, or the path to the pond. They walked around my setup, and when they reached my car, one guy went around the front, while the one holding the dog on the leash circled my car. I assumed they realized I had noticed they were approaching, and that I was no longer vulnerable, as they regrouped and walked further away, up, and around through the soccer field. Once I was no longer in danger, I glanced down at my phone and saw that the couple I was supposed to meet had seemingly forgotten about our appointment and were at the beach, at that point, I was so frustrated that I jumped out of the car, gathered up all my props, and shoved them into the car. This was my first experience of how frightening it can be for a young woman out alone. I have had multiple experiences since then, but this one stands out the most because I am convinced those guys had ill intentions. 
And what chance would a 17-year-old girl stand against two grown men and a pit bull? One thing is for certain, I will never return to that park alone. Story 30 This story took place in 2020 when I was 18 years old. I lived in a safe neighborhood, although my country had a high overall crime rate, so that is worth noting. Earlier in the year, my dad had passed away, and as I had no siblings, my mom and I lived alone in our house. The COVID lockdowns were still in place, but certain restrictions were being lifted, and people were gradually returning to work. Between my house and the train tracks lay an empty field, this area became a peaceful, quiet space where I could escape whenever I needed a break from the house. I would often visit once a day for a cigarette or two, sometimes for a little picnic. My home situation was complicated, to say the least, and due to the pandemic, I had nowhere else to go. On this day, I went there for a few minutes to have a smoke, as usual. I was about halfway through my cigarette when I noticed a young man walking along the train tracks on the other side of the field. He was barefoot and wore dirty, worn-out clothes. He noticed me and made a hand gesture, indicating that he wanted to smoke. I should have just left, but as a teenager, I found it hard to say no to people. I crossed the field and handed him a cigarette. He took it, and immediately, I felt uneasy about the way he was looking at me. He asked me, don't you live in that house over there, while pointing to my house. I evaded the question, realizing that I needed to leave. I had left my front gate that day, and for him to know where I lived, he must have observed me leaving from the back gate before. I told him I needed to go. He began insisting on giving me a hug to say thank you, and I declined several times. At this point, I turned around and started walking away quickly. But I did not get very far. He caught up to me, put his arm around my waist, and panicked, not knowing what to do. All I could think of was that I needed to get away. I tried to start running, but he grabbed me from behind and started dragging me toward a row of houses where the view from the road was completely blocked. The fences were high, too, so no one could see the field from their backyards. We were completely isolated. I struggled and kicked, desperate to escape his grasp. He eventually threw me to the ground with him on top of me, still holding me down. I could not kick him, and my arms were trapped. That is when I realized my only option was to scream for help. Suddenly, I was free. I could move. He had let go and jumped off me, running away. My heart was still pounding, and I was in shock from the terrifying encounter. He vanished into the industrial area on the other side of the train tracks. I immediately ran toward the road, and when I reached it, I realized it was empty. No cars were parked in my neighbor's driveways, and no one had heard my screams. If he had realized that day could have had a far worse ending. He knew where I lived, and I was terrified of him returning. For months, I suffered from panic attacks and nightmares, and I could barely leave my house without breaking down. I moved away from there a year later, but I still get scared when I am home alone or walking around town. Fortunately, I never saw him again, and I hope I never will.